Okay, well, Matthew, I know you're going to be sharing in a few moments uh, with us. Looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to pray very briefly now, and then we're going to hand over to Pat, who's going to continue praying for, for some of our missionaries. So, so Lord, we, we, we thank you for the work of OM um, all around the world. We want to pray specifically for the UK team, um, people that are um, sort of serving here in different capacities. Would you unite them? Would you bless them? Would you guide them for the future? Um, we, we, we pray for those waiting to go overseas as well, God, and just ask, Lord God, that they would know your patience and your favour and at the appropriate time, they would be able to, to get out there to, to, to where you want them to be. And Lord, as we um, just continue praying for our, our missionaries, God, we, we pray that you would keep us faithful in prayer. Amen. Almighty God, thank you for your created world. Thank you for your great faithfulness and love towards all people demonstrated by sending the Lord Jesus to die on the cross, taking our sin upon himself. Thank you that he rose again, overcoming death. And because he rose again, we can approach you, the everlasting God, and be forgiven for our sins if we believe in him. We pray for your world for harmony and stability, for leaders to come together in agreement and for a sharing of the lavish resources with which you have blessed us all. We pray for a movement of the Holy Spirit to bring all peoples of all nations to recognise Jesus as Lord and Saviour. We lift to you those connected to this place who seek to bring the good news to those who have not heard. Thank you for what Paul and Tanya Tanner have done whilst in Botswana. We pray that work would continue. And for Paul and Tanya as they explore the possibility of working with Fairfield Church, may they know your leading and guidance. For the leadership at Fairfield, we ask your wisdom as they decide on this appointment. Thank you for the miraculous recovery of John Matiza from COVID-19. We ask for strength and energy for John as he takes up his new role as president of UCCZ Church. Give him your wisdom as he undertakes to effect change within and disciple the church bringing them to a deeper faith in you. We ask your protection and good health for John and Katani as they battle with raging inflation and difficulties obtaining food and fuel. We thank you for Jordan and Annalena in Poland. Lead and guide them as they do training online within the church and the community. Be, please be equipping them for future service for you. For Mary Melrose in California with YWAM, we ask your protection, good health and your equipping to undertake the tasks required. We pray that you would give vision for media use and good friendships with the students she is working amongst. We pray for Dave Roberts and Partakers Ministries worldwide that this ministry might expand, leading more people to come to know you in a new and deeper way. We pray that answers may be seen for the COVID-19 prayer groups. Thank you for Acts for Sharing who support people in need locally. We ask as they carry out this work, that those ministered to would come to hear about Jesus and know him as their saviour. Bless that work, we pray. We ask for all these people a deep sense of your presence and peace and that people ministered to might encounter the living Lord and accept him for themselves. For ourselves, we request that your Holy Spirit Challenge us to play our part in your work, whether that be through prayer, giving of time or finances or being prepared to go. Speak to each one of us this morning, we pray. 
All these things we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that your name may be lifted high and all the glory would be yours. Amen. Well, many thanks, Pat. You know, in Romans 15, um, verses 5 and 6, we read these words, that may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we're going to pause for a moment. And um, in our homes, we're going to take uh, just a minute or so to pray for the COVID situation. You know, we're united together, praying together at the same time for what is happening in our nation and in our world. So Almighty God, united together, we ask for your mercy on our nation and world at this time. May people find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we ask that you would speak to us now, as Anne reads and as Matthew shares, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you want to be turning to um, Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, Anne's going to be reading to us, and it's on page 181 of the Love Ring with New Testaments. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul, the minister to the Gentiles. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. Because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. Paul's plan to visit Rome. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I've been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, <clears throat> and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, 
I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favourably received by the Lord's people there so that I might come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. I wonder what are you looking forward to? I mean, what are you really looking forward to when all of this is over, when there's no longer any restrictions or lockdown, life is back to how it used to be? What are you really looking forward to? Maybe it's just that thought of being able to freely visit relatives and friends, just dropping in on friends, maybe inviting them round, um, unplanned, just going out to a restaurant or a pub or whatever it might be. Maybe you're really looking forward to being able to return to work and not having to worry about being furloughed or working from home. Uh, maybe it's just about children getting back to school and not having to be so involved in overseeing uh, their work from home. Perhaps you're just looking forward to being able to go out and not have to wear a mask not have to, have to social distance. You remember the days when we used to shake hands and we were allowed to hug each other? Uh, maybe in our churches, we're just looking forward to being able to sing, sing out loud with all our hearts and not worry about um, infecting people through the way we're breathing or singing or through our words. <sighs> Attending sporting events, you know, the year that my team, Bournemouth, go on this amazing cup run and it's all very exciting. I and my boys aren't allowed into the stadium to watch them. Um, it's a difficult time. Uh, maybe, maybe we're looking forward to dreaming about a summer holiday, just a time away in the midst of this, this cold winter, just dreaming of being on a warm beach somewhere. What are you really looking forward to? You know, I found myself the other day as I was just browsing some different articles, I succumbed to what my children tell me is called clickbait. You see, I saw this article that said the 10 most beautiful beaches in Spain. And I thought, oh, I'll click on that. And I clicked on and I saw these, these beautiful sandy coves with crystal clear waters. And I found myself daydreaming of a, a, a summer holiday in Spain. It, it just seems so attractive, uh, and yet it seems so distant. And of course, I might have lost some of you as you're now starting to dream about similar things. But I just want to bring you back to the text that we were, we're looking at today. The Apostle Paul wrote to these Christians in Rome. And we were reading from chapter 15. And the reason that I was a, attracted to this text is because Paul, in chapter 15, well, he's making plans to go to Spain. Uh, he's writing a note to his friends, or perhaps he's not met those folks yet, but he's heard that there are believers in Rome, and he writes to them. And he says, I want to visit you. I want to enjoy fellowship with you. First, I'm going to head down to Jerusalem. I'm going to pop in on some friends there. And then I'm going to come up to Rome and meet you. And then I'm heading off to Spain. I mean, this idea of a European tour, going around to different countries, visiting friends, going on a cruise through the Mediterranean and ending up on a beach in Spain. Well, this is why I've been attracted, I think, to these, to these uh, words that Paul wrote. We don't know if he ever got to Spain. What we do know is that the plans he lays out here in Romans 15, well, they don't seem to work out. And you know, I'm perhaps, as I say, drawn to this text because here's the Apostle Paul saying he wants to get to Spain. Here's the Apostle Paul saying he wants to visit friends, uh, but his plans don't work out and he ends up in some sort of enforced lockdown. And I wonder if we can relate somewhat 
to Paul and some of his experiences. And my prayer is that as we look together at this text and what's happening around this text, uh, that God through his word would speak to us and we would hear what he wants us to hear. We'd be challenged about what he wants us to be challenged about, but also encouraged as we look at his word together. So if you're ready and you've got Romans 15 open, let's understand a little bit what's happening um, around this time. You see, Paul writes this letter and at that time he's probably been travelling around what we now know as Turkey and Greece for the previous 10 years or so. He's been on a number of missionary journeys. This is in the midst probably of his third missionary, missionary journey. We're told he's probably in Corinth, one of the places where he's planted a church. Um, and he wants to get to Rome and then he wants to go on to Spain. So he's laying out these detailed plans. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Ephesus, head down to Jerusalem, cruise up to Rome, and then you can help me on my way to Spain. These were Paul's plans. Um, and he sets off and gets to Ephesus and, well, all sorts of problems there. And the believers send him off to Jerusalem. And it's a very emotional farewell because Paul says, I know that I'm going to have problems. I know that maybe things aren't going to go to plan. I don't believe I'm ever going to see you again. He says goodbye to his friends in Ephesus and he sails down to Jerusalem. And it's exactly what he and the believers in Ephesus had predicted. Paul, within a few days, finds himself on trial before the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And then there's this plot to kill Paul. And then he's whisked away under Roman guard to Caesarea, another city. And then we read over the next chapters of the book of Acts how Paul stands trial in front of Felix and then Festus and then King Agrippa. This doesn't happen quickly. It's over a period of time. And finally... Paul is sent from Caesarea, from Jerusalem, and he goes on a ship and is heading towards Rome. This isn't some Mediterranean cruise, but he's a prisoner. And it's years later, and then there's the shipwreck, and probably something between three to five years later, Paul arrives in Rome. This is not what he had planned when he wrote to the believers in Rome. He wanted to get there sooner and yet things didn't work out. His plans didn't work out and finally he gets to Rome and he's under some sort of house arrest. He's in lockdown and it's there that he writes, it seems, most of those pastoral letters that make up part of our New Testament. Paul's plans didn't work out. And of course, then we look at our own situation, don't we? Consider this last year or so. I wonder if you felt discouraged at times. I wonder if you felt lonely, frustrated, doubts and questions. Lord, how much longer will all of this last? And, and what's the point of making plans about anything? You know, we talk with our teenage kids and, you know, two of them had A-levels, GCSEs cancelled. One of them just entered university for a first year in these, last, um, in these last months. And, well, that's a very unusual first year at university. Another one's taking a gap year, wanting to serve with OM and travel to different places, mission discipleship programs, that's not working out. And of course, more recently, we've all tried to make plans for visiting family over Christmas. Well, that didn't work out. Plans and dreams for holiday, well, forget it. <laughs> We're really not sure. Visiting friends, just popping in on people, celebrating birthdays, weddings, even funerals. So much has had to change. So many plans have to change. And the question is, how do we cope? How can we keep pressing on? How did Paul keep pressing on and cope with 
all the changes that he had to experience. You know, I'd love just to kind of interview Paul. Hey, Paul, what, what's your secret? How did you keep pressing on in the midst of those discouragements, in the midst of that, the suffering and all the, the problems, the, the attacks from outside and the doubts and the questions within? How, Paul, could you keep on writing about peace and joy and love and assurance? How could you write so convincingly when you were experiencing everything that you were experiencing? You wrote to the Philippians about rejoice in all circumstances. You're in prison. How could you keep on making plans? How could you write to the Romans and tell them that you're going to do this and this and this when you know it's not going to work out? And I'd love to ask him, Paul, how could you have such a passionate, committed desire to make God known in the world? How could you keep going with this? What's your secret? Well, to answer this question, we look at, yes, the description of Paul's journey in in the book of Acts, but also his letters, what he writes. And, And the thing that impresses me amongst many in the writings of Paul that we have in the New Testament are that his letters are full of hope. Again and again he writes, he speaks of the hope that he has, the hope that he has in God through Jesus Christ. And even before those plans that he writes about at the end of Romans 15, the plans to go to Jerusalem and then Rome and then Spain. Even before that, listen to what he writes. Romans 15 verse 4. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Let me just say that again. What's written in the past, what we find in the in the scriptures. Provides us with endurance and encouragement so that we might have hope. If we're lacking hope today, if we don't know which way to turn. Then maybe we should be following Paul's example and looking in the scriptures. Because it's in the scriptures that we receive encouragement and we can endure and we learn about God and what it means to trust him and follow him. Studying the scriptures allows us to grow in our knowledge of God. And when we grow in our knowledge of God, then we know that he is a God who can be trusted. He's a God who is in control. A God who can help us even through the darker times of lockdowns and restrictions and changing plans and so much uncertainty. That's what I see as I study Romans 15. Paul, who writes this, is someone who knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He knew the God who is described through the scriptures, the God who is holy, who is set apart, and yet the God who loves us. The God who longs to draw near to us through his son, Jesus. Paul had experienced God as a loving father, accepting, loving, showing grace, undeserved, unmerited reward and blessing. Paul knew that God was an ever-present strength and refuge. Paul would have known that The the Psalms, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. I was reading in my morning Bible, reading this morning in Psalm 27. And there we read, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? If we know the scriptures, we grow in our understanding of God and we know that God is with us. We can have that same hope. That same assurance, the faith, faith that's grounded in the sovereignty of God. What does that mean? Faith grounded in the sovereignty of God means faith that knows and trusts that God is sovereign or God is in control. 
He is on the throne. We have unwavering, unshakable certainty that our life is in his hands. He cares for us. He loves us. And no one and nothing can separate us from the love of God that's found in Jesus Christ. Paul knew that. He wrote that. Romans chapter 8. The assurance of hope. And that hope and that faith that flowed out of a deep knowledge of knowing God, the God who's described in the scriptures and who reveals himself through the scriptures. The more Paul knew God, the more he learned he could trust him. That he was a good father who knew what was best. Maybe that's how Paul could continue to make plans, continue to press on, because he knew that his life was in God's hands. And so, I suppose we have to ask the question, don't we? Do we know and experience the same hope that Paul writes about here to the Christians in Rome? During this pandemic and the suffering and the questions and frustrations and the changing plans, when loved ones are becoming sick, when we cannot freely visit and spend time with those we love, when the kids are just driving us crazy and we're longing for them to be back in school and some sort of normality, when we fear what the future might bring, when we make plans but the plans just keep on having to be shelved and changed over and over again and we can become desperate just longing for life to return to kind of what it used to be. It's in these times that we can and we must hold on to the hope and the belief that God loves us and he cares for us and he's holding us in his hands, trusting in the one who is, who is sovereign and who cares for us. The one who's in control even when things don't work out. Now the writer to the Hebrews, probably not Paul, writing in Hebrews 6 verse 9, says this, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. That sounds good, doesn't it? Hope that is like an anchor for the soul. An anchor's heavy. It's strong. It's reliable. It's unshakable. It's unmovable. Keep something in place. And this is what hope is described as in the New Testament. Something that will hold us, hold us firm in the midst of the storms of life. This is the hope which I'm speaking about. This is the hope that that Paul writes about. It's like an anchor for the soul. You you know, this morning I was um, cycling to the office so as to uh, record this sermon. And I cycled past our local chapel just on the corner of one of the streets and a new sign is in the notice board and it says this the virus is not your biggest problem prepare to meet with God (laughs) I nearly fell off my bike (laughs) wow that caught my attention I suppose it was supposed to catch our attention the virus is not your biggest problem prepare to meet with God now it wasn't the most subtle perhaps the most sensitive message, but it did catch my attention this morning. And I do believe that it's true. (laughs) The virus is a huge problem. It's impacting so much, so many around the world. And yet, there are other things that we need to be aware of. And I and I say that as I ask this question, what, what are we what are we placing our hope in? You know, we watch the news and we realise there are so many people who are placing their hope in the vaccine. We're hearing all the time, aren't we, about these vaccinations that are being rolled out. If we could just get enough people vaccinated, then uh, everything will surely return to normal. And we thank God for these vaccines and we pray that they'll be effective. But then we're fearful, aren't we? What about other strains of COVID? What what if other coronaviruses spring up in the next years? And what about long term, the economy? And what about my job? Is my job safe? And 
what will life be like for my kids and for my grandkids? And well, we can live in fear of all sorts of other illnesses and accidents. We pray a vaccine will help bring an end to this pandemic. But a vaccine doesn't give us all encompassing hope for the future. It, it doesn't solve all our problems. But trusting in Jesus does give us all encompassing hope. It does make a difference for our lives. Knowing him, turning to the scriptures daily, drawing closer to him, experiencing him and his love, knowing that same assurance that the Apostle Paul knew that my life's in God's hands and he, he cares for me. I have this hope as an anchor that is firm for the soul, holding me firm and secure. He is a refuge and strength. He's my light and my salvation. This is the hope. This is my hope. Therefore, I don't need to fear anything. Now, we're going to pause here and just give some further thought to that. We're going to watch and worship as we uh, sing this hymn together. And then we'll come back. And, and the second part isn't as long, don't worry. But, um, but I do want to continue on as we're talking about the hope we have in Christ. And then what does this mean for us? We we'll continue to look at Paul's journey and Paul's writings, especially in Romans 15. In brokenness I'm wandering Through all my fear and unbelief Your faithfulness appears to me again Through mountain top and valley low In every season this I know Your goodness like the dawn will break again All your mercies rising in this heart again, and my soul begins to sing. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, your mercies are new every morning. Every morning, great is your faithfulness. Every good and perfect gift in your endless grace you give, flowing from the Father's heart to mine. Beams of heaven as I go. This wilderness below the fullness of your love for all of time. All your mercies rising in this heart again, and my soul begins to sing. They are new every morning. again all your mercies rising forever shining in this grateful heart again 
Apostle Paul has this hope that is grounded in his faith that flows from the knowledge of God through the scriptures. And we've been looking at Romans 15 and let's just read a little bit what he says before he talks about those plans to go to Spain and, 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 and Jerusalem and Rome etc. Before that he actually writes from verse 9 about this desire to make the gospel known to the Gentiles. He says, I will praise you amongst the Gentiles. When he says Gentiles, it's the, the, the Greek word ethno, the, the peoples, the, the ethno-linguistic peoples of the world. I, I will make you known amongst all peoples. He's quoting from one of the ancient prophets. And he, he says in verse 10 again, rejoice you peoples, you Gentiles. And again, praise the Lord, all you peoples. And then this promise, this prophecy in verse 12, that from the root of Jesse, that line of Jesse and David will come the Messiah who will spring up. He will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles, the peoples, all peoples will hope. Again, he's speaking of hope. All peoples will put their hope in Jesus. Jesus is the only hope. For God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus. He loved all people and so he sent Jesus. All people can place their hope in him. We've got that picture, haven't we, in Revelation of all peoples around the throne worshipping the lamb who was, who was slain. People from every tribe and nation and people. And this is what Paul says before he goes on to say, and I want to go to Spain. You see, his reason for wanting to go to Spain was to preach the good news of Jesus, to share this hope that he had in God through Jesus. He wanted to share that to people and in places where the good news had not been preached. He says to the Corinthian Christians, it's the love of Christ that compels me. I have to go. I have to share. I have to speak. I have to preach. Because the love of Christ is in me. The hope of Christ is in me. And I want to share that with others. This love, this acceptance, this forgiveness, the, the assurance and the joy and the peace, the hope. I, I have to share that with all. This is good news for all peoples. And the problem is that 2,000 years after we read Paul having this passionate desire to make Christ known, and of course many others as well, well, we look around the world today and what, what do we see? We see that there are still so many people who do not have that same hope. So many people who live in hopeless situations. So many who are yet to experience or even hear about the love of Christ and the hope that he gives. At the beginning of this pandemic, think back to last March. And just in a time of prayer together with others, we were reminded here at OM of the words that Jesus spoke. John chapter 4 verse 35, lift up your eyes, open your eyes. And see that the fields are ripe for harvest. 
And it was that phrase, lift up your eyes or open your eyes, that really struck me, really gripped me. Wow, what does that mean? What does it mean for me as I'm tempted just to be concerned about my own life, my own family, my own situation? Uh, I'm reminded to, to look beyond. Yes, I have a hope in God. I can freely, freely hear and experience God's love. I live in a country where we have an NHS that gives free health care to everybody. And we have a government who can put billions of pounds towards fighting this virus and propping up the economy. Living in a country where we're seeing real progress with the vaccination. But what about when I lift up my eyes and look beyond? What about when we look beyond? Just in these last days, I got a letter from a friend in Zambia. A friend who's involved with OM in discipling and reaching out to least reached peoples, um, evangelizing, discipling others, seeing others mobilized to go out to unreached peoples throughout Africa. And this brother shared with me, amongst other things, that in the recent days, they've had to take their daughter out of school. They can't afford to pay for the schooling for their daughter anymore. Uh, he, he shared with me that they've gone from having two meals a, week, uh, a day as a family down to one meal a day because they don't have the same support and finances coming in for their family. <laughs> Open up your eyes, look beyond. Just saw pictures on the news recently, didn't we, of the situation in Brazil and in fact in other Latin American countries where people desperately going to try and buy and f refill oxygen tanks to take back to the hospitals to keep their loved ones alive. We, we know of so many countries and places where people can't afford to take those who are ill to hospital and they can't afford the medicines. Those who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic. Just reading a report this morning from the UNHCR, the situation with the Rohingya people who have fled Myanmar in southern Bangladesh. And I had the opportunity of visiting this refugee camp, close to a million people in southern Bangladesh, just a year or a couple of years ago. <laughs> a refugee camp with a million people. And now COVID is sweeping through the camp and the supply of food trying to support all of these people has dropped off significantly. The suffering, the suffering in our world as we lift up our eyes and look beyond our own situation. We're talking of all peoples having the opportunity of hearing about the hope of Jesus. And yet we understand out of 17,000 distinct ethno-linguistic people groups in the world, there's still 7,400 who are considered unreached. The good news of Jesus hasn't yet, hasn't yet got into those peoples. One in three people in the world are yet to hear of the hope found in Jesus Christ. That's close to two billion people sharing the planet with us who live in places, in areas where there's no opportunity to hear of Jesus. I mean, when we pause and consider that, so many who live in parts of the world where there's no gospel witness. The hope that we hold on to, that transforms our life and our perspective, has yet to be heard or experienced by so many people around the world. I'll never forget one of our first visits to Moldova in the 90s. And as we're there with a group of young people from Romania and Ukraine, and we're preaching the gospel in a town called Kahul. And we're going from factory to school to college to kindergarten to the marketplace, preaching about the hope we have in Jesus. And people were so open to hear of this good news that we were sharing. In one teacher training college, the director was a little suspicious, but she said, you, you can have 20 minutes to share with all the students and all the teachers, all the students filled this large auditorium, 400 students and 20 or so teachers at the front of the, 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 the big room. And there we stood as a group of young people sharing for 20 minutes the hope we have in Jesus. And at one stage, this 
teacher stood up and she shouted. She was angry. She shouted, <laughs> We all wonder what on earth was she saying. What she said was, why have we never heard this message before? Why have we never heard this message before? We spent the next four hours with all of those students sharing about the hope we have in Jesus. Why had they never heard before? Because no one had gone. No one had told them. Paul wrote about this just a little bit early, didn't he, in Romans? How can they call on the one they've not believed in? How can they believe without hearing? How can they hear unless someone tells them? And how can someone tell them or preach unless they're sent? Those who are sent, well, they've got beautiful feet. How beautiful are your feet as you listen to this message? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? How beautiful are the feet of those who share the hope that they have experienced with others? And so we finish with this. We're sort of in Romans 15, aren't we? Paul's plans to go to Spain. Twice he tells us, he, oh, I long to go to Spain. Yeah, I do too, Paul. But not for beaches, not for holiday. I'm passionate and I have a desire to go to Spain, says Paul, because I want to share the hope that I have with those who have never had the opportunity of hearing. This has been a long and difficult winter. At the beginning of the year, a time of prayer as our leaders and someone said to me, you know, Matthew, someone we just heard, we should just go into hibernation. <laughs> Let's just hibernate this winter and, and emerge in the spring and everything will be OK. And I said, you know what? We're not called to be a people of hibernation because we're a people of hope. We have this hope. Surely we should seek every opportunity to share the hope that we have with as many people as possible. And so we go, and so we pray, so we give what we can towards the work of God around the world, so that the hope that we have in God and his son Jesus Christ might be made known to all nations, all peoples. And Paul finishes with, well I finish with Paul's words in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you, God, for your amazing love and mercies new every morning. Please help us to share that hope with family and friends. And again, may the God of hope Fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thanks again for being with us today. Uh, if you'd like to have a, got a question for Matthew, I just want to say hi, then feel free to join us on the chat on Zoom um, at 11 o'clock. Just time to grab a coffee first. Um, next week, we're going to be continuing our well-being series. And we're going to be looking at what we can learn from the life of Elijah with the highs and lows that he experienced. Lots of people are benefiting in home groups from the well-being course or the well-being journey course. So um, other churches in Ringwood are also doing it. So if you'd like to either join in with one of our groups or join in with one of their groups, then we're very welcome to kind of mix together. That's fantastic. Um, we're also setting up a group specifically for people that are new to church. That's going to be on Friday evenings. And Pip and I are going to be um, working with Chris and Sue and Luke in hosting that. So Friday evenings from the 26th, 7.30 p.m. So if you're new and you want to just improve your well-being, then please do um, consider joining us. Children and young people, um, hopefully you've been enjoying the videos that, that um, Carl's done for children and youngsters and your Bible time sheets. Um, older teens, you of course have your Zoom call from 11.30. Do um, enjoy that. Please do contact Sarah if you'd like a copy of the prayer, a paper copy of the prayer directory. And 
Um, if you haven't updated your photo recently, then it might be time to do that so people actually recognise us uh, when we're back together, whenever that might be. Let's keep the pictures coming in when we get a chance to get out on our walks or in the garden so everybody can be enjoying those. Um, so thank you this week to Susan, to Sarah, to Keith and to Anne. And um, just, just one new idea we've had. If you're stuck inside and you, maybe you've done some craft or pictures, not just talking about children, adults as well, then do send in pictures of those as well. And to get things rolling today, um, Scott sent in some hammerbead stuff that he's done. So do enjoy looking at that as well. As ever, it's high fives to the youngsters, it's elbow bumps, it's handshakes, it's big hugs to everybody. God bless, stay safe and stay in touch. <laughs>